I come this morning to the third exchange made at the cross. For our sinfulness, we receive his righteousness. Now, people will fight you. Christians will fight you over this. I'll just recount a little story. We went into a church. I won't mention where it was, but it was in France. And uh, it didn't have a, a, an ordained minister, but the man said he was a minister. He was a soignison, in other words, a self-appointed minister. And... Um, he was talking about uh, being sinners. And I said, well, I'm not a sinner. I'm the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Oh, he wasn't pleased by that. How can you tell me you're righteous? Only one is righteous. I said, yes. And he gave me his righteousness. He says, well, you're a sinner. I said, no, I'm not a sinner. And we left. So people will fight you to be sinners. But look at what it says in Isaiah 53 and verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He put him to grief. And when he shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. And then in verse 11, it says, He shall justify my servant, shall justify many, and make many righteous in right standing with God. For he shall bear their iniquities and their guilt with the consequences, even the consequences of the guilt. That's uh, verse 11. So Isaiah 53, if you just scroll down a little bit from the verses we've been looking at, we find some more beautiful truths. And uh, in order to understand the significance of making your soul an offering for sin, a guilt or sin offering, we have to look back into the laws that God gave Moses in Leviticus. Now, I know Leviticus may not be your favourite uh, book and, um, and so on. It's full of, full of laws for the Jews. But the root of faith and the root of our Christianity, that's the root is in Judaism. And um, when a person sinned during the time that these laws apply, when a person sinned, he had to bring his sacrificial offering to the priest. Now, it might be a sheep might be a goat, might be a ram, might be a bullock, but he brought the animal to the priest and he confessed his sin to the priest. Now, the priest then did something very symbolic. He put his hands on the, uh, on the animal. Let me just uh, take this little animal from up here. I just remembered he was there. He put his hands on the animal and transferred the sin of the man onto the animal. And then he killed the animal and made it an offering. And uh, notice he killed the animal, not the man. So the, the, the little, this is a sheep, he's not real, he's just a, a, an imitation sheep, but he shows the point I'm making. This animal was a sin offering. When the priest laid hands on the animal, the sin was transferred to the animal. And the animal became sin. Now that's very important to understand. It was a, an animal which became a sin offering. And the animal paid for the man's sin with his own blood. Now the Apostle Paul, who had revelation, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, God chose him to write a lot of the New Testament. The Apostle Paul was a, a Jew, he understood Leviticus, and in his own uh, uh, revelation that he had, he wrote 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. He told the Corinthian church, God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us, that we might become made the righteousness of God. Now imagine that this little uh, this little sheep, you see, this little sheep perhaps was righteous. Jesus was the Lamb of God. His righteousness became ours and our sin became his. There's the exchange. Now unless you understand the, the uh, Old Testament sacrifices, you wouldn't appreciate that 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Apostle Paul is quoting Isaiah 53.10, probably it's not in your Bible margin, but it's, that's the reference. 
going back to that reference. When God made Jesus' soul an offering for sin, Jesus became sin with the sin of humanity. He actually became sin. He didn't just carry our sin, he became sin, so that we might become the righteousness of God. Well, praise God. We've got his righteousness. It's not my righteousness. My righteousness is as filthy rags, the, the Bible says. That righteousness was imputed, put into my account. You can uh, benefit from reading Romans 4, where uh, God spoke there uh, through the Apostle Paul and explained examples in Abraham and David. So we have imputed, put into our account, God's righteousness. You sigh a sigh of relief. We don't have to struggle to do our best to be righteous. We were sinners, but Christ died for us. Romans 5 and verse 8. And you have to receive it by faith. You have to believe that you're righteous. You might look in the mirror and say, well, I don't look very righteous. And sometimes I don't behave very righteous. But, you know, we're imperfect people. We have now got God's righteousness, the righteousness of Christ. Any lower level of righteousness will never get you into heaven. So God has made provision for you and he's made provision for me to be made righteous with the righteousness of God. Let's just do that exchange once more. Jesus was made sin, say it with me, Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. It's a good thing to confess it, say it out aloud, because uh, God hears your confession. Here's a prayer to end with. Lord Jesus, we are so relieved to know that because of your abundance of grace, we can receive the gift of righteousness. Romans 5, 17. I don't have to become righteous by my own efforts. Thank you, Jesus. See you again next time. Bye-bye.